Good morning. Good morning. It's nice to be back. Thank you very much for prayers, cards, thoughts, calls, whatever. Um, Gary and I appreciate it greatly. Um, it just goes to show that a church family is truly a blessing to have because if the times are tough, they'll come through for you. So thank you all so much for the calls and, and everything else. Um, I don't see anything on the weekly schedule, um, so I don't think there's any meetings this week. Dawn? I wanted to let you know, today we're celebrating Native American Awareness Sunday, so if you look outside in front of the elevator, we've got a display of different Native American facts and all sorts of stuff, and I'd like to thank Jeff Graham for helping me put that together. Dawn is just letting us know about the Native American um, display that we have out there that Jeff Graham helped her with. Um, I did notice last week when I was listening that when you guys talk out there, they don't hear on the internet. So if I repeat things, that's why. Um, it's either that or I get to come out there with a the microphone. And y'all can talk in the microphone. So anyway, but thank you, Dawn. Thank you, Jeff for um, doing that for the Native Americans. Are there any other announcements this morning? Okay. We'll have our opening song.
join me on page 881 for our affirmation of faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and stood at the right hand of the God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, the life everlasting. Amen. Yes, Dave. We had a joy in the service, so we didn't get a birthday. 
62? Yeah. Yeah. Charles having his birthday. Uh, Debbie? Mary Margaret, who is sitting back there with Debbie, is one of the blessings that God gave to Debbie and I and to Big uh, when she began to worship there. And she's one of those people that always brings a smile to our face when we see her. Anyone else? Uh, joy, sorrow, and concern? Donna? My husband's birthday is coming up this coming Saturday. And you want to share that number? What he's going to be? Same year we were born. Okay. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> Another birthday. Anyone else? Okay. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious Father, it's with a humble heart and a heart filled with hope that we gather here. We know, Father, that it is pleasing in your sight for us to gather in your name. We also know, Father, that by coming together we might encourage one another as we hear your words proclaimed and as we lift up songs of praise to you. We know, Father, that in fellowship we can empower, and by being empowered we're enabled to live the life that you were calling each and every one of us to live. We come, Father, admitting to our sins, confessing to our sins, for we know that we all fall short of the throne of God. And we know, Father, that no matter how hard we might strive, it's not within our power. And yet you, through your love, sent your Son to do for us that which we could not do for ourselves, to take away not only my sins, but the sins of this whole world. And for this, Father, we give you our thanks. And likewise, we lift up those joys of birthdays, of graduations, of friendships. We lift up to you those concerns we have for health and job security. We lift up to you, Father, the concerns that we may have for a spouse or for our children or our friends. But we know, Father, that you hear each and every prayer. And we know that you answer each and every prayer. And so, Father, hear our prayer of gratitude. And grant unto us eyes that see and ears that hear. And grant us, Father, the desire to follow, to seek you as relentlessly as you have sought us. Father, we pray this morning in a special prayer for the children that they will be held safe within your hands and that we may always set the good example before them. And now we ask that you remind us to pray together as your son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our next hymn is 540. I love thy kingdom. Please stand if you're able. We'll sing all the verses.
Have you guys ever known Kalani Cook? Yeah? Okay. Well, I'll tell you what. Here's my bowl. Here's the mixing bowl. This is the mixing bowl. You get a whisk. You get a spoon. Don't get grandma with it. <laughs> you want a whisk too? Sure. Alright. Alright. Let's put our mixing bowl up there. Alright. This is disciple powder. Alright, shake a little disciple powder in there and see what happens. If anything. <laughs> shake it in there. Shake it in there. Okay, good job. Let's stir it up. Bring your whisks and your spoons and stuff and let's stir it all up. Can you stir it? Can you reach it? Stir it. Is there anything in there to stir? No! There's nothing in there to stir? I know. Hey, tell you what. Let's try. Let's try a harp. What do you think? Do you think a harp will make something? Yeah. Let's stir up a harp. You want to stir up a harp? You want to stir it up? Oh, look at that. You're doing a good job. Oh, my. My, my, my. Good job. Good job. You want to stir up the harp? All right. You know what we're trying to do? We are trying to make disciples with our disciple power. Only it's not working very well, is it? There's nothing in there except a heart. Do you suppose we need a recipe? Yes. A recipe. Why did I think of that? A recipe. Where do you think we can find a recipe on how to make a disciple? In my bag. In my bag? <laughs> I don't see anything. There is a book. But I don't think it's the right book. What kind of book do you think we need to make a recipe? Cookbook. Cookbook would be good, wouldn't it? What about the Bible? Do you suppose the Bible would tell us how to make disciples? Yeah, it says cook right there, doesn't it? Cook, cook, cook. Yeah. Well, we need to remember that if we want to make disciples, we need to get the right recipe book. And the right recipe book is the Bible. Because it tells us we're supposed to go out and make disciples. Yeah, go out and make disciples. Now, that's not an easy thing to do, is it? No, not easy at all. Well, thank you guys for helping me try to make a disciple. And we'll work some more on that later on, okay? All right, let's pray real quick. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you've given us the recipe book, your Bible that will be able to help us to thoroughly know how to make disciples. Because each and every one of us is called to make disciples along with being a disciple. So Father, just guide and protect us this day. In your precious holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Do you need that? Oh, <laughs> well that's fine. Thank you so much. Whiskey slobber. The ushers will come forward and we'll worship God with his tithes and offerings. Heavenly Father, you have blessed us with blessings upon blessings. We ask now the opportunity to return some part of that blessing to be used for your purposes and for your glory. We pray this in his name. Amen. <laughs>
second scripture is found on page 109 in your pew Bibles. It comes from the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John, verses 23 through 29. And again, this is the lectionary reading for the sixth Sunday of Easter. Uh, and I'm reading this from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. Starting with the 23rd verse, we hear these words. And Jesus answered him, Those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. And whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but is from the Father who sent me. Now I have said these things to you while I am still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I'm going away, and I'm coming to you. If you love me, you'll rejoice that I am going to the Father, because the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you this before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Because of the love of God, and solely because of the love of God, we were granted a great gift. We were granted the Word of God. We go through life, we know somehow deep within us because of the way we were made, that things aren't what they should be. Most of us realize all through our lives that there's more to this than the simple passing of the days. There's more to it than paying the bill and, and having a few laughs and then going to the grave and then it's over and it's forgotten. And many people will spend their life searching for that thing that leaves them empty. And that's not God's desire. So God gave us his word. God gave us his revelation. God said, I want you to know me and to know me fully. I don't want you to know about me. God is not some theorem for you to examine and see if you can prove. And God is not some being who you would study like you would some other creature. God is the creator. God is life, and God is life, and light, and hope. And God, listen, has spread a table, folks. And the feast has been set. And you have been invited. And that invitation comes not by the merit of your work, because we all fall short of the throne of God. That invitation comes not because of what we might do once we hear the word and because we choose to follow Christ. It comes because the love of God is sufficient for every man, woman, and child, the love of God is greater than any sin that you or I or this world might commit. And the desire of God is not your punishment, but your reclamation. God's desire is to have you, his children, return to him. And to this, he gave us his word. Jesus Christ, I am the word, I am the light, I am the way. No one comes unto the Father except by me. And on this day, Jesus knew that he was going to be soon parted from these disciples. And he knew that they would be shattered by that experience. And so he didn't say, well, you know, I've told you everything. I've said everything I can. You either paid attention or you didn't. You've heard what i got to say. Now either step up and live by it or suffer the consequences of it. It's in your ballpark. you got the ball. What are you going to do with it? None of that. 
Because that's not him. That's not his way. He doesn't do tit for tat. It's not about reciprocity. So he says to them, if you love me, you're going to keep my word. If you don't love me, you won't. And do you know something? Listen, do you know something? These aren't my words. These are the words of my father. In other words, I'm not telling you what I think. I'm telling you what I know. Because the words that I speak come from him who made all things. So God's word to God's people is, if you love me, you will keep my word. Now folks, don't miss it. What is the word of God? It's Jesus Christ. If you keep Christ, then you have Christ and you have life and if I will be in you as the Father is in me, my Father will come and we will make our home with you. Listen to what he's offering here. And he knows that they're going to be upset. He knows they're going to be shattered by his physical departure. But he tells them, don't let your heart be troubled. Don't be afraid. Over and over and over again, we are commanded, admonished by God, not to be afraid. Because people who fear don't function. Fear becomes their function. We're not called to hide in the shadows. We're called to shout it from the rooftops. We're called to be that light set upon the table to cast the light, not to be hidden under the basket. We're called to be the salt of the world. We're called to be the hands, the feet, and the voice of God in this world. You say, well, you don't know me. No, but he does. And you say, well, you don't know my sins, and you don't know my shortcomings, you don't know my failures. No, I don't. But he does, and in light of all of your sins, all of your failures, all of your shortcoming, he goes, let your hearts not be troubled. Believe in me. Keep my word. Jesus said, I've told you I have to go, but if I go, I'll come again. I'm coming back. But while I'm gone, the Father is going to send the Holy Advocate. He's going to send the Spirit of the living God to abide with you. Think about that. Think about how the presence of the living God, if you live your life, it's here whether you acknowledge it or not, first off. God is not sitting in heaven waiting to see if you'll respond, and then if you do, make this journey to come and be by your side. God is already by your side. God breathed the breath in, the body, in your body that you now breathe. He molded the face that looks out of the mirror at you every morning. And he's been with you even before you were born. I knew you before you were knitted in your mother's womb. I have your name written upon my palm. I know the number of hairs upon your head. If I know when a bird falls from the sky, how much more do I know about you? Folks, listen to what he's telling you. Jesus said, listen, I'm going, I'm coming back. But the Father is sending his Spirit, the Holy Spirit of the living God, to abide with you. How different your life will be if you live your life in awareness of the presence of the living God. I told Debbie yesterday, I had found where this person was writing about a movie that they'd seen several years ago, and I, I don't know the name of the movie, I'd like to find the name of this movie. But it was about a woman, married couple, children, and the husband left the house, and he never returned. And for the first few days, the wife was, you know, beside herself with 
what had happened, you know, where, where was her husband, why had he not returned, no one sees him, he can't be found. But as the days become weeks, and there is no body or no message, or he's just literally like vanished into thin air, she realizes that he's left her and their family. He has chosen to break this family and to go away. Apparently found another woman and gone off to live his life and forget about them. And when that realization comes home to her, everything about her changes. The rejection, the hurt, the pain, all begins to color everything that she does, even in her dealing with her own children. And her life becomes just a, a horror. And a year, year and a half after the husband had left her, they found the husband in a hole that he'd fallen into on the day that he had walked out of the house and had been killed. He had not left her. He had not deserted the family. But the damage was done because she operated from a misconception. She operated from a falsehood. Well, folks, there's a lot of falsehood in this world that tells you that you're too bad for God to love, that tells you you've gone too far for God to come back, that tells you that no one, especially God, who's holy, could have anything to do with someone who's done and said the things that we've done and said. And that's a falsehood. And that will separate you from him. It tells you in the Bible that I loved you even when you were a sinner. And Jesus says, listen, God is sending his spirit. His spirit will not only abide with you, but his spirit will tell you and remind you of the things that I've said to you. You know, on the table up here, the banner wasn't down, I think. You see the words, remember. Remember what I've said. Remember what I've done. Remember what God has done. And what we're given here is a promise. A promise from God. Not like our promises. A promise from God. We promise people things as a reward. We promise people things to manipulate them. We promise them in hopes of a return. God promises are not based on anything that involves us. God doesn't give his promise in response to our righteousness. He doesn't give his promise in response to our goodness or our love or our mercy or anything else. He gives his promise because it's his nature. And his nature is love. And the focus of his love is you in me, and the rest of creation. Mary Margaret and Debbie and I had a conversation the other day, and I was telling her that if you read St. Paul, Paul brings up two things, drums them in. God is the only God, and God is the Father. He never calls God anything but the Father. It's always God the Father. God is the only God, God's Father. And those two things are foundation, foundation stones, and they cannot be separated. If God is the only God, and that's all there is to him, and he's all-powerful, it has nothing to do with us. There's no love there. And if God is the Father, but there are other gods, then what he wants for us may or may not be because there are other powers. But if God is the only power, and we are the focus of his love, which he is, then the thing that you can count on is that promise. And that promise is, come unto me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. That promise is that his love can do for you what no one else could do. His promise to you is, his desire is that you come back and that you have life. I started this with saying that God has laid a table, and on that table is a feast. Why would you settle for the crumbs? when that feast is there. It is your Father's desire that we all come together and to live that life that He intended 
to live that life of fullness. I came so that you might not just have life, and what he said, but life abundantly. Not just life, life abundantly. Jesus knows that this world is hard. He knows it better than you and I do. He knows that to follow Christ or to follow God is not the easiest path. Look at the life he lived. Look at what he experienced in his life. And he knows that we will be troubled. He knows that we need that person that we can trust. And the one that you can trust is God. I told him in the service this morning, the first service, there's a man, and all of you in here may be aware of him, or some of you may not have heard of him. He was a monk from about the 13 or 1400s called Brother Lawrence. Brother Lawrence of the Resurrection. Brother Lawrence said that he could be as close to God washing dishes in the kitchen and standing up here and celebrating Holy Communion. You know what he means by that? God is everywhere. God's not found simply in a worship house. God is found in you. God is found in this world outside that he created. And Brother Lawrence came up with this phrase that I have held there since I found it, which is called this, practice the presence of the living God. You are called to practice the presence of the living God. Do you know that if daily, moment by moment, you lived your life with awareness of that God, the living God, the creator of all, that his spirit is here now with you. How different would your life be? And here's the surprising things, folks. He is here. You may not accept it. You may reject it. He's not serving at your whim. And he's not rejected by your sin. He's here to practice the presence of the living God. This is what he's talking about. The promise, you listening, leads to what? It leads to his presence. What more could you want? What more do you need in your life to face all of the fears and all the dark valleys and all the mountain peaks than an awareness of the living God in your presence? Promise brings the presence. And guess what the presence brings? Peace. A peace beyond all comprehension. The peace of God. Not as the world gives do I give. The peace of God. It doesn't mean you won't have tears. It doesn't mean you won't have sorrows. It doesn't mean you won't have pain. It means that God will be with you every bit of the way. And nothing can separate you from that love. Nothing. Not life, not death, not powers, not principalities, nothing. The living presence of God. The promise, the presence, and the peace. The last thing Jesus is recorded saying in the Gospel of Matthew, For lo, I am with you always, even to the close of the age. I am your God and you are my people and I will come and I will make my home in your presence. And I will be your God and you will be my people. The feast has been laid. You have been invited. Folks, practice the presence. Practice the presence of the living God and find that peace which conquers all nothing that can separate you from it. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious Father, we falter when our eyes turn towards ourselves. Our blindness comes from looking to ourselves. Our weakness is found within us. So Father, may our eyes behold your glory. May our hearts and spirit and soul be filled with your word, with your Son, Jesus Christ. For to know Christ is to know life. 
And may we live our lives in a manner, Father, that glorifies you. Not only on this day, but on each and every day that has been granted unto us. Until that day comes when we're all gathered together again. In that place where there will be no more separation. And this we pray in his name. Amen. Closing hymn for the morning will be number 2282 in the faith we sing. Your little black hymn on the pew. We will sing all three verses. Please stand if you're able. 2282.